Fellowship. Uh, and I welcome you to our first uh, GlowCal Career Development uh, webinar. And today I'm really excited to introduce Dr. Stephanie Strathody. Uh, I think on, on more importantly, you know, she's been the co-principal investigator for the GlowCal Fellowship for many years. And uh, she has such a great insight in, ter in terms of the fellowship. And I think it's very fitting that she's our inaugural career uh, development uh, webinar speaker today. Uh, so in the interest of time, I wanted to turn the floor over to Dr. Strathody. And hopefully, I think um, towards the end, I think this is from like eight to nine. So hopefully towards the end, we'll have some time for questions. So welcome, Dr. Strathody. Thanks very much, Jay. And welcome to all of you fellows uh, for TIG Locale. And congratulations for um, being uh, admitted into this fellowship program. Um, I'm going to be uh, telling you an interesting story today. Um, it's through the lens of my career. Um, it's called The Perfect Predator, A Scientist Race to Save Her Husband from a Deadly Superbug. It's, um, and, and that's actually the name of, of the book that, um, that spawned out of this story. So um, uh, as well, if there isn't time for you to ask your question today, feel free to reach out to me by email or by Twitter. Twitter is a great place to network in the global health sphere. My Twitter handle is changing the world. It's right there on the title slide. A few disclosures. My husband and I now hold stock in a phage company. I won't be talking about that company today. And all patient photos are used with permission. So just to begin, um, when I was a young girl, I always wanted to be a scientist. Um, I changed direction in terms of what kind of scientist I wanted to be, but I always had a lot of curiosity. However, I had real challenges with math right from the beginning. I mean, I had trouble learning how to subtract, <laughs> multiply, and later um, I got a D in calculus, not once, but twice. And this almost um, doomed me. Um, but um, I decided to get a tutor to swallow my pride, and I eventually learned that if I wanted to be an epidemiologist, which is the career path that I, I got interested in, that statistics was a tool that, that gets me where I need to go. I don't have to get excited about it, but I have to learn how to do it. So things got a little bit better. And of course, um, you know, everybody has their own view of what a scientist is, you know, so this slide always makes me giggle. What my mom thinks I do is more like the Bill Nye version. Um, and uh, what I think I do is more like the Einstein version. But what I really do is these days a lot of paperwork, um, but I've spent a lot of time in the field. So I'm originally from Canada and I was recruited to Johns Hopkins. I worked there for five years and then I met the love of my life who convinced me to move to California to join him at the University of California, San Diego. And then we started working together on the Mexico US border, um, which is um, the, the two countries that have the, the biggest um, disparities in income between them and with, with uh, a lot of uh, pursuant health outcomes um, like HIV and viral hepatitis, which is where, what I specialized in and as well as substance use. I ended up working extensively with substance users and sex workers um, this is a picture of the Tijuana River Canal. That line um, on the pavement there is actually the U.S.-Mexico uh, border. And on the left side, you can see the big wall. That's the U.S. side. The Mexican side doesn't have as many restrictions. And many of our participants actually in our studies lived literally in this canal in open sewers. Um, and I, I uh, worked um, in a binational collaboration for many years um, these are pictures that our participants took of their own lives, and um, we chronicled many of their health problems and found that their HIV prevalence in Tijuana was much higher than in the U.S. or Mexico by itself. We published these data together with our Mexican counterparts and um, used this data to leverage uh, more resources for the border region. Um, one of my highlights of my career was that um, my Mexican colleagues were able to leverage the data that we collected to have a successful bid for the Global Fund for HIV prevention um, to the tune of $76 million. 
um, and uh, that was used to expand um, programs around the country. Um, our team was also profiled in Science Magazine, and I had a personal profile in The Lancet um, a number of years ago. So things were going really swimmingly well in my career. And then around uh, 2015, my husband and I went on this vacation to Egypt, um, and things took a little bit of a turn um, in an unexpected way. So we were on vacation, we were going to see the Valley of the Kings, and he got violently ill after a meal that we'd have, and I just assumed it was food poisoning. So I don't have a medical degree, um, but because I'm an infectious disease epidemiologist, I was thinking, okay, you know, this has got to be food poisoning. I was calculating incubation periods for the different organisms that could be in my head. And um, he was just get, kept getting worse. We ended up calling a, a doctor to the ship because we were on a cruise ship at the time. And he said, your husband's going into shock. Yeah, got him to a local clinic because there was no hospital in Luxor where we were based. But the doctors were very well trained and um, they did the best that they could. They diagnosed pancreatitis and inflammation of the pancreas. But um, the, the village had a CT scanner and they were able to see that there was something on the CT scanner that they didn't like at all. They didn't tell me exactly what was going on, but they were able to help me get medevac, get it medevac out uh, first to Germany and then back home to San Diego. So um, there's a reason why we spend so much time getting um, travel insurance for all of you um, uh, that are living abroad because um, sometimes you might need it. And uh, my husband required seven ambulances and two Lear jets to get him home. So that cost us $36 in travel insurance. So it was very well spent. On the right hand side, you see him um, in uh, Germany. You'll see that I'm in full PPE now. Everybody knows what that is because of COVID. So I had a, a mask and gloves and gown. And I just thought that this was a precaution because we've come from Egypt and the doctor's saying there's a lot of multi-drug resistant organisms and we're just being on the safe side while we try to find out what's wrong with him. Well, um, and this is a, a couple of pictures from the journey. I literally didn't think that this was very serious at the time. I was posting these to Facebook saying, okay, well, you know, I'm sure he'll be bouncing back in a few days. And he wasn't. In fact, the doctors found a giant abscess the size of a small football in his abdomen. It was caused by a gallstone that had stuck in his bile duct to, that caused this abscess to form. But inside the abscess was this putrid fluid that was clearly growing some kind of organism. And they cultured it and they came back telling me that it was Acinetobacter bomanii. And unfortunately, this is one of the uh, most serious superbugs or bacteria that have multiple uh, resistance genes to different antibiotics. You'll see that this slide shows that it tops the list in terms of being a critical danger to human health. So it is a global health problem. Um, the physicians in Germany did what's called an antibiogram, which is an antibiotic susceptibility profile. And I didn't speak German, and maybe you don't either, but you can see from this chart that, uh, that uh, this list of all these different antibiotics, there's an R next to most of them, standing for resistance. It was only partially sensitive to three antibiotics, but it became resistant to the remainder of them in the short two weeks that it took to get them stabilized and medevaced back to San Diego. So by this time, I was starting to get worried. Um, I realized that I'd been hearing from the UN and the WHO that the antimicrobial resistance crisis was getting worse, but I didn't realize until I started looking into the literature that it's estimated that by 2050, superbugs could kill 10 million people per year. That's one person every three seconds. And that this is a post-antibiotic era that we're entering now where infections that used to be treatable with antibiotics are no longer treatable anymore. Now, how do we get into this mess? Well, it's actually a major global health problem that I won't have time to get into today, but it's really our reliance of antibiotics, not just in human medicine, but also in agriculture, because in the US and several countries, 70% of antibiotics are used in agriculture to make animals grow fatter faster. They're, they've been used on or off label as growth promoters. And it's our reliance on meat that has put us in this mess. 
So here, back to our story, my husband, by the time we got him back to the University of California, San Diego, where my colleagues were now caring for him, he was very ill. Um, he, at, when this photo was taken, he was on a ventilator. He was on three different pressors to keep his heart pumping. And the doctors asked me if I wanted to start kidney dialysis because his kidneys were just hanging on by a thread. And I knew that that meant that, you know, they didn't think he was going to make it. And it was obviously a very tortuous period. Um, and um, I asked my husband, even though he was in a coma, if he wanted to live. And I said, if you want to live, please squeeze my hand. I'll try to like do something um, to try to turn this around. And he squeezed my hand. So I was very excited, but then I realized what a daunting prospect this was because again, I'm not a medical doctor. So how could I do better than any of the doctors that were caring for him? Well, I did what anybody would do in my shoes. I went home and I started researching alternatives and I came across this paper that was written by um, people in Spain in 2013. And it mentioned phage therapy as a potential treatment for multi-drug resistant um, superbugs like the superbug that he had. And I knew what phage were. These are viruses that have naturally evolved to attack bacteria. And in fact, they'd been discovered over a hundred years ago, as early as 1896, Hankin, a British um, bacteriologist was studying water from the Ganges river because there was folklore saying that the water was holy and could cure infections. And he was able to take the water, pass it through a Pasteur filter, and that filtrate was able to kill cholera bacteria on a Petri plate. And he didn't know what he was looking at, but he said there's something in the water that has a bacteriolytic agent. Well, this kind of experiment was repeated for several years, but it wasn't until 1917 that Félix de Harel, a French-Canadian uh, self-taught microbiologist, was able to repeat this kind of experiment and found that it could actually cure um, dysentery, bacterial dysentery in children. And he deduced that this must be a virus because it's smaller than bacteria because if it can pass through a pasteur filter and it seems to be a parasite of bacteria. Nobody really knew at the time whether Felix was right or not. There was a big controversy in the field. He actually went on to help the fellow on this slide, Georgi Ilyava, set up what became the first phage therapy center in the world in what is now Tbilisi, Georgia, the former Soviet Union. And um, then it actually got the reputation of being Soviet medicine. And this was around um, the 1930s. And so this was a, like around the time that World War II was beginning and Russia was an enemy. So that created a geopolitical bias against phage therapy because it was seen as Soviet science. So um, also penicillin came on the scene and that meant that phage therapy was relegated to the back burner in the West, although it continued to be used in the former Soviet Union and in parts of Eastern Europe. Um, and that's also because phage are very specific. They need to be matched to a specific bacteria. It isn't just like any phage will kill any bacteria they attach through a receptor. In fact, here's an electron micrograph. It wasn't until the early 1940s that the scanning that electron microscopy began um, to be used. So that was when the first one was created in Germany. This is a scanning electron micrograph showing a bacterium stained in orange being attacked by phages that are stained in green. And they look a little bit like alien spiders. You see that they're attaching to the bacterium through a receptor. They drill into it, their um, genetic material, usually DNA, enters the bacterial cell, takes it over and turns it into a phage manufacturing plant if it's the lytic cycle of the phage. I'll talk about another life cycle later on. And um, these baby phages or virions burst out of the bacterial cell when given the kill signal and they go on to attack other bacteria that have the same receptor. So it's very interesting because it's a self-limiting process. As long as there's bacteria that the phage match to, they will keep um, you know, going on in succession, successive waves, killing the bacterium. We know now that phages come in all shapes and sizes. There's a couple pictured on the bottom of this slide. There's 10 million trillion trillion phages. That's 10 to the power of 31 estimated to be on the planet. And about 30 billion phages move in and out of our bodies every single day. They're everywhere. They're in water. 
they're in soil, they're in, in our bodies already, but you need to find the right phages to kill the right bacteria. So the more I read about this, the more excited I got. Now, where do you get phages from? Well, like I said, they're everywhere, but if you have a gut um, bug that you wanna kill, a, a great place to find phages that will kill them is in sewage because there's a lot of bacteria there. So then you'll find the perfect predator to kill those bacteria. So here's a flask of sewage. I'm showing you the plaque assay. This is a Petri dish um, that's streaked with uh, bacterial colonies. And if you want to see if you have um, a sewage sample that has phage that will kill that bacteria, you put a drop of sewage on the plate, you incubate the dish for 24 to 48 hours. You see if it comes back with these little, what look like halos, there's holes literally in the agar. And that's because the phage have been gobbling up those bacterial colonies and you get excited. You pluck out those um, like little plaques and you add more bacterial suspension so that you can let nature do its work and grow those phages up. So the more I read about this, the more excited I got, I thought, could we use phages to treat Tom? Well, it turns out that phage therapy in the West, because of the geopolitical biases and some other reasons that we can talk about later, was really not being used. It was only being used in parts of the former Soviet Union and in Poland. And um, so it was considered experimental treatment. So I had to uh, get my colleagues to agree that if we could find phages that would match Tom's bacterial isolate, that they would agree to treat him. And they said, yes, we'll have to call the FDA and get permission, but first you got to find phages. Like, so I went back to the internet, made a list of people who were studying the same superbug my husband had and phage, phage and I approached them cold told our story, sent a picture of my husband and, um, and like lying there in a coma. And lo and behold, the first person to get back to me was Dr. Ryland Young from Texas A&M University. He said he would turn his lab into a command center if I could send him the bacterial isolate. And so, of course, my colleagues and I said, yes, we will do this. And the lab, um, the microbiology lab at UCSD prepared it, sent it off to Texas. And the team on the right-hand side of this slide um, really like went all out. In fact, the woman with the necklace was a PhD student at the time. She's now Dr. Adriana Carolina Hernandez. She slept in the laboratory for two weeks trying to find phage that would match my husband's isolate. And she found four that matched, which was very exciting. So once we heard that, um, Dr. Chip Schooley, who was then the head of infectious diseases at UC San Diego, uh, called the FDA to say, okay, we've got this guy who's going to die. Could we use this phage therapy? And expected to tell the FDA all about what phage was. He you know, had the literature to back it up. Dr. Cara Fiore at the FDA um, answered the call. She's the microbiologist um, and she's, she knew all about phage therapy. She says, look, the FDA has actually been looking and hoping to have a case like this someday where a patient is dying a family is willing to give it to them, a doctor like you that's willing to oversee the protocol, a phage community that's willing to step up to the plate, and a hospital that's willing to take the risks. Yes, if we will allow this to go forward, but there is other people that are studying this um, that you might want to reach out to. And Chip said, well, Stephanie did a pretty thorough literature search, and, and uh, Dr. Fury said, no, no, no. This is like the Army and the Navy. Well, lo and behold, uh, this is Lieutenant Commander Theron Hamilton from uh, the U.S. Navy Biologic Defense Research Directorate that he led at the time. They had a phage library that um, was very extensive. Um, it was not publicized. The phage had been sourced from the bilges of ships, and um, he uh, was convinced to uh, get um, his colleague, Dr. Biswajit Biswas, who's uh, pictured on the right-hand side, to see whether any of the phages that they had that were active against Acinetobacter gomanii could kill Tom's isolate. And um, they found four phages that matched. Well, you might be asking, well, if we already had four phages, why were we going to look for more? Well, really, it's because you want to have multiple phages um, because if there is only a single phage, the bacteria could become resistant to the phage very quickly. The bacteria multiplying every 20 minutes, they're trying to outwit the phage. 
the phage are developing anti-crispers to the bacteria crispers. So it's like a real duel that's going on at the microbial level. And ideally you want phage that are gonna hit different receptors, but we didn't have the time to sequence these uh, bacterial phage to find out um, what, what receptors they would be um, looking for. So we just took our chances. So now we had two phage cocktails, but Dr. Schooley had a real dilemma because the, he had no experience doing this, even though he's a top infectious disease physician, really very few people did. And he reached out to Dr. Maya Mirabishvili, who was trained at what is now the Ileava Phage Therapy Center in Georgia, the Republic of Georgia. She now works in Belgium, where they had um, a, a phage therapy center that was just emerging at the Royal Astrid Military Hospital. And she said, this is how we, we uh, dose phages um, for um, you know, infections uh, through catheters like my husband had. Um, but she said, we don't usually treat people intravenously because the patient could die from septic shock. And Dr. Merrill, um, who had worked at the NIH um, said, look, you're gonna need to treat this guy intravenously because um, he's fully colonized with this bacteria. And if there's a hidden reservoir of bacteria that the phage can't reach, um, the phage could, be, could make the bacteria resistant very quickly. So all of these questions, how much phage, phage what routes of administration, how often, how long, nobody really knew. Dr. Schooley took the best um, estimates that he could gather. He advised the investigational pharmacy at UC San Diego that was used to preparing drugs for trials, but this is the first time that the drug was alive and it took them a while, but uh, this is the phage preparation. It looked pretty innocent, but there was a billion phages per dose that we were going to be injecting into my husband every two hours. This is what he looked like the day that we started phage therapy. He was um, really like within hours of dying, I was told later. I signed the, the consent form for kidney dialysis the day the phage therapy started. Uh, we didn't ultimately need um, it though. This is Dr. Schooley and Dr. Randy Taplitz who were part of the team that cared for him. You can see they're smiling for the camera rather nervously I might add because they knew they were making medical history. This is the first patient um, that we are aware of to have a, a, a systemic superbug infection that was treated intravenously with phage therapy in the United States. And uh, first we took the uh, Texas phages. We administered those um, through the catheters in his abdomen. I say we, but I really mean the medical team. I was standing uh, helplessly by. Um, and when he lived through that, um, we took the Navy phages, which were more virulent, and we injected those into his bloodstream through his pick line. Again, a billion phages per dose every two hours. And we just prayed that he wouldn't die of septic shock because, you know, again, you're injecting a foreign agent into, um, you know, somebody. And so um, luckily, three days later, he lifted his head off the pillow, kissed his daughter's hand, and made what was a miraculous but very long and arduous recovery because he'd lost 100 pounds and um, was very deconditioned. And um, he left ultimately the hospital after his nine months of being in the hospital with wearing his Superman shirt. And um, he later met Lieutenant Commander Theron Hamilton and um, the others who have played a role in his case. His case was published by Dr. Schooley in a journal. Um, interestingly, it was passed over by some of the top uh, medical journals. Um, we, again, because of the, the bias that had been so pervasive against phage therapy that we're now trying to overturn. This is a scanning electron micrograph of Tom's bacteria being attacked by the Navy phages. You can see that was uh, prepared by the Department of Homeland Security. I like to throw darts at this. Um, and um, all of a sudden my husband's case attracted incredible attention. It went, the story went viral around the world um, when it was first presented at the 100th anniversary of the discovery of the bacteriophage a year after he recovered in April of 2017. Uh, you'll see that the journals JAMA and Lancet um, uh, covered the story as well. JAMA did a Q&A with Dr. Schooley um, after rejecting the paper. Lancet um, had a commentary about, um, the, about 
phage therapy and mentioned the story. And then it was covered in Time Magazine, People, Mother Jones, I mean, The Guardian, it just went on and on. And then I started to get phone calls, as did Dr. Schooley, from patients and their families from all over the world. The first call was from China. Will you help my loved one? He's dying from the same bacteria. And of course, total strangers had stepped up to the plate to save my husband. So I felt like I had to help them too, but we were reinventing the wheel every single time we had to find phage. Would the phage match? We had to get the bacterial isolate. We, you know, it, it, was, it was a lot of work. Sometimes we helped the patient. Sometimes we couldn't get phage in time. Um, we have treated many other phage therapy patients now at UC San Diego and consulted on, um, you know, probably over 100 cases around the world. Um, we've treated different bacterial infections with different underlying conditions. We've had considerable success, um, and, but these are patients who are um, generally compassionate use cases, meaning that the patient is going to die unless they receive something like this experimental treatment. Um, and that's because it's still experimental until the clinical trials get done. But our chancellor at UC San Diego was so um, invigorated by the successes we had that he gave us seed funding to open what is now the first dedicated phage therapy center in North America, the Center for Innovative Phage Applications and Therapeutics, that is a nonprofit at UC San Diego. The day we opened in June of 2018, Science Magazine published a commentary where um, a microbiologist was quoted as saying that this is a game changer in the field. It's been an awesome experience. I co-direct this center with Dr. Schooley. Um, also in 2019, right before the COVID pandemic began, NIH funded their first phage therapy trial to the tune of $12 million through the Antimicrobial Resistance Leadership Group. Dr. Schooley's the PI on this trial. It was delayed due to COVID, but it is due to start enrolling in early 2022 and will be a multi-site trial. Um, NIH has gone on to fund another phage therapy trial. We need multiple trials in order to advance the field. Um, and until then in the West, it's still going to be um, seen as experimental treatment, but in uh, Georgia and in Poland, it's standard of care. Um, I also, um, before I end, I also want to make you aware that that the field has moved forward very quickly. The first um, genetically engineered phage cocktail to be used to successfully treat a patient um, was published in May of 2019. This is Isabel. She has cystic fibrosis, which means that she has a genetic mutation that causes mucus to build up in the lungs. That's a wonderful breeding ground for superbug infections. Um, and those get selected for because of their extensive exposure to antibiotics. Isabel um, had a double lung transplant. She was dying of Mycobacterium abscessus, which is a cousin to tuberculosis. She was in hospice when her mother heard about phage therapy, reached out to her physician who reached across the pond and phage that had been sourced by students in what is um, an educational program called the Sea Phages Program run by Dr. Graham Hatful at the University of Pittsburgh. These phages had never been used to treat um, a human case because nobody really knew their therapeutic potential. But when Isabel's case was presented to Dr. Hatful, he agreed to see whether or not some of the, these phages would be useful to kill um, her organism. And lo and behold, he found one lytic phage, that's the kind that kills the bacterial cell, but he found two other phages that were temperate. And those are um, what I call the sleepy phages in our book. And they enter the bacterial cell and they integrate into the, uh, their genetic material into the bacterial cell DNA and hit the snooze button. Well, we don't want those for phage therapy. We want the killing phage rage kind. So since that's all he could find, he uh, clipped out the repressor gene using a technique called recombineering, which is a predecessor to um, CRISPR-Cas gene editing. And he was able to convert those tempered phage into lytic phages, forcing those phage to become lytic. So this was the first genetically modified phage cocktail. We were grateful that the UK government did not consider it a GMO because a gene was taken away, a gene was not added. And Isabel received phage therapy intravenously based on the protocol that Tom had received and she left the hospital within a week. So she's had a rocky um, course of recovery and ups and downs because CF is a very um, immunosuppressive and, and difficult condition, but nevertheless, she has had a new lease on life because of phage therapy. 
So I'm gonna end this uh, presentation by saying um, that when I look at my career in perspective now, I realize that a D in calculus is not the end of the world. And also that what appears that, that, that could be the worst ordeal of your life <clears throat> can't have a silver lining. And as Glocal Fellows, you are gonna hit bumps in the road. I mean, the COVID pandemic alone means that we are experiencing delays um, in supply chains or IRB approvals, things that you never anticipated. Or you might observe something that you weren't anticipating in your research project that might open up a new avenue. So don't always look at the cup half empty. Look at the cup half full. I look back as my, does my husband on this experience and we realized how privileged we were and the fact that it's helped other people and is now being um, upheld that phage therapy could be the most promising alternative and adjunct to antibiotics out there. And at the time, we, we, we just were in our own myopic little world. So step outside yourself, grab the brass ring and realize that this is an opportunity to you um, and um, reach out for help if you need it, because there is a global village of researchers around the world that are willing to do what it takes to advance the field forward. We've seen it in COVID. Within a year, four vaccines or more were developed. And so I just want to end this with um, a story of hope. Um, my husband and I, because we were so privileged, we decided to write a book about our story so that Hopefully we could advance phage therapy and by bringing awareness um, um, about it and the superbug crisis. If you're interested, there's more at our website, but this isn't about making money. It's about raising awareness and um, encouraging more people to go into science. So I want to thank a number of people that um, have played a role in IPATH, but also a global village of researchers and physicians um, and family members, um, some of whom we haven't even met. Um, and with that, I'll stop and see if anybody has any questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Strathody. What a wonderful and inspiring journey you've shared with us. So yeah, so I welcome questions uh, for Dr. Strathody. So you can feel free to unmute. And so I see a bunch of thank yous on the chat. Any questions? It doesn't have to be about phage therapy. It can be about <laughs> career stuff. As I know that I covered a lot of ground today. Okay, thank you. This is Steven. Hi, Steven. Yeah. So yeah, thank you for the for the story. It's so inspiring, and it's a lesson to learn. I was just wondering what was going through you during all this entire process when uh, the loved one was in this situation, and then how did you manage to turn that into a career a career path? I know you've concluded by saying yes, can actually end up. How do you look at it that way? That this could be a path now that I to, to take on and make sure that I, I know you got calls from a number of people, but how did you make it as your core career path and a thematic area of interest? Thank you. Yes, thank you for your question. So obviously when my husband was in the hospital and he was literally dying, my focus was um, just solely on trying to save his life. I didn't think about any potential um, ramifications for the field, for phage therapy, or anything like that. It was just just focused on him. But while he was still in the hospital recovering, Dr. Schooley came to us and said, you know, do we have your permission to share some pictures in your story with um, a family whose two-year-old is, um, you know, dying of a superbug infection and because we'd like to see if we can help them with phage therapy. And Tom and I looked at each other and started to cry um, as we realized that, you know, this story was bigger than us. And that's when I realized, wow, you know, this might have the potential to help other people. And I asked Dr. Schooley, is, is, am I just, um, you know, naive here? But is this, could this be like important? And he said, absolutely, this is really important. And so 
Um, that's when I decided to, that we would tell our story. Um, I didn't know at the time that we were going to write a book, but, um, then, um, when we, when we started to get approached by other patients, um, and I teamed up with Dr. Schooley, cause again, I'm not a physician, so I couldn't give advice. Um, you know, we, I just said, well, are we going to try to help these other patients? He says, absolutely. Let's do what we can. And then we started to gather partners. So different labs that had different phage libraries were turning to us and saying, we'll do a phage hunt. Um, and so we now have a network of laboratories. There's 10 or more. Some are companies that or startups. Most are research institutions like universities. It's not all are in the US. Um, we work with partners in Israel and Belgium, um, Canada, other places. And um, the need is so great. And when I realized that this really was a global health story and that maybe this happened to us for a reason, um, maybe this is the reason I'm on the planet. Um, um, I, I decided that um, maybe, you know, I should start to put more time and energy into this. So it just evolved over time. Now, my husband's been in the hospital for five years. So it it's been, um, you know, a kind of a sea change, but for me, I'm not a virologist and I'm not a medical doctor. So I'm more of, um, I guess, a, a figurehead and a spokesperson and a cheerleader and an administrator when it comes to phage therapy. But if I was in the field of like deciding where to go with my career right now, I probably would move into this field because um, antimicrobial resistance is a major problem and it's going to get worse and it's also worsening under COVID. So um, there's also, for those of you that work in Africa, if you're interested in this, um, there is a, uh, an NGO called Phages for Global Health that's run by um, a woman who um, uh, is named uh, Toby Nagel and she offers um, phage um, hunting workshops and there's going to be one fairly soon. There's one also for Southeast Asia um, countries. And so feel free to reach out to me or to look up Phages for Global Health. They're also on Twitter. Hi, Dr. Strathby. I had a question um, about, you had mentioned um, that there's kind of some background to this superbug problem um, related to agriculture and the use of antibiotics in agriculture. And um, I was wondering if you, you kind of, you know, mentioned that, but didn't say too much about it. And I just wondered if you could talk just a little bit more about that. And, and um, because I'm really interested in that kind of exposure side of it and um, curious about also how you think your husband, uh, you said you, he got maybe exposed through a meal that you guys had, but I was wondering, yeah, I guess how, how you kind of put those things together and, and how you think that, uh, happened, I guess. Sure. <laughs> well, the, to answer the easy question first, so it really wasn't food poisoning. He'd actually had this gallstone all along and, and this abscess really created a nice little apartment for the superbug to move into. So it turned out that it was an Egyptian strain of the, of the bacteria, but um, you know, that was sequenced later. So we don't really know how he acquired the bacterium. It could have been anywhere. Um, because it's fairly ubiquitous. But in terms of um, antimicrobial resistance, it's important to look at it through a One Health lens. Um, and of course, the UCGHI has a center on planetary health. So those of you who are interested in that um, um, perspective, that center might be a, a great resource for you. Um, One Health is the concept or theoretical framework that it's the interface between animals, the environment, and humans. And, you know, with um, um, thinking about antibiotic misuse and use, it's use in animals and uh, for livestock, like giving um, antibiotics to livestock to prevent um, infection or as a growth promoter. Um, now, countries, several countries have banned the use of antibiotics as a growth promoter, but there's ways that um, people are using it off label um, or that veterinarians who are supposed to have oversight on this don't put time limits on the, on the use of antibiotics in, in certain livestock. And they obviously there's agribusiness that is lobbying to use antibiotics because they make money off of it. Um, antibiotics are also used in, uh, on crops. So 
For example, um, the US um, under the Trump administration allowed um, streptomycin to be used on citrus, um, even though it doesn't even work and promotes a more antimicrobial resistance when you're using the same antibiotics in agriculture or um, you know that you're using in humans, that's going to be the worst case scenario because it's going to breed resistance. So there's researchers that have used a molecular clock where they have sequenced um, the uh, superbugs from patients and from farms and from the runoff and have like literally been able to draw a connection between um, the use of specific antibiotics the um, resistance genes that are emerging in the environment, the runoff, and then um, the cases. In this case, it was a urinary tract infection or that were seen in hospitalized patients. So that um, kind of um, evidence is being used to lobby um, to pass stricter laws um, and to have more um, benchmarks for a national action plan against um, you know, the misuse of, of antibiotics. So there's, there's huge efforts that need to be done in this space. And um, I'm getting involved in different aspects to try to make a difference using our family's story to draw attention to it. Um, I'm happy to follow up with you separately if you'd like to get more details or more resources. Sure, thank you very much. That's great. So we have a couple of hands up. Uh, let's see, I think. Do I say your name right, Skola Matovu? Yeah, you said it perfectly. Thank you, okay. Dr. Strati. It's a pleasure listening to you. What a fascinating story. Um, as Stephen um, asked, I can't imagine what was going through your mind or throughout this process uh, trying to serve your husband. So it must have been quite the ordeal. Um, mine is just a comment to say that thank you for acknowledging privilege, privilege in global health, but also you, privilege for you as a, uh, you know, uh, an educated person who had access, who knew where to find the information you needed to find, uh, who had access to the journals and to the doctors that you had to call, but you as a white person who may have access to certain resources that any other group might not be able to um, uh, have access to or to be heard, uh, to reach out to FDA and get a response um, like you did. So I think that's important and I appreciate that you acknowledge that in your presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you know, that's been something that um, is, is evolved um, in my um, understanding as well, um, because, you know, we all are privileged um, and just to be able to have, uh, be on an internet connection, uh, sharing our stories and experiences. And um, we can use that privilege to extend um, our, a hand to our colleagues around the world. And um, I think that it's so important that we decolonize global health. And this is something that the UCGHI and the Fogarty International Center are paying more attention to because just when you look at COVID and the vaccine inequity that exists right now, um, it's a perfect example of the haves and the have nots. And so, um, we would hate for our story to um, just, uh, you know, just to benefit the very few. Um, the majority of people who are dying from antimicrobial resistant um, infections are in lower and middle income countries and phage are everywhere. And where we have a lot of sewage, you have a lot of phage. So our goal is to actually build a international phage library that would be open access and to build capacity for um, lower and middle income countries to be able to use phage to treat bacterial infections. So that's my next goal. <laughs> Good for you. Thank you Great. for your work. Great. And then we have Jalika Joyner. Hi, yes. Thank you for your presentation. That was such an amazing story. Um, I, I did have a question about um, the going back to the antibiotic use in animals. Um, so uh, as a vet, we were you know, taught in school that um, you know, you're, you're supposed to have this nice washout period when you use an antibiotic in livestock. And of course they came out with the new law, well, not brand new, but fairly new law about removing antibiotics from like feed stores so you can't use it like um, just willy-nilly. Um, it has to be through a vet client relationship. So are we just finding that 
veterinarians are just misusing this still and not doing the proper washout phase on top of everything or doing it by um, by like uh, whole groups instead of doing individual treatments. Um, I was just wondering where we're still seeing the problem. Well, each country ha is different in terms of their laws. And, and, um, and this isn't an area that I claim to have expertise on, um, but the reading that I've done and the experts that I've talked to have identified different problems in countries that have these laws. So for example, um, lack of enforcement. Um, and um, lack of uh, time limits. So when an animal is, you know, an animal is supposed to receive antibiotics um, to treat or prevent a disease, but you know, it, it shouldn't be the life of that animal that they're on that on the antibiotics. So um, there's no follow through in some cases to make sure that that you know that there's. Uh, um, a stoppage of, of the antibiotic. And so, and many countries don't have these laws at all. Um, so, um, and then the, the, there's changes in government that have made some of these laws more lax. So for example, we had stricter laws in the US around the use of antibiotics in agriculture for a while. And then the, the government changed and then agribusiness lobby, you know, was able to, um, you know, get a reprieve and so um it's it, the epa um you know is is actually um you know being approached by lobbying groups right now um a couple are actually even trying to sue the federal government because of this and so um you know it's it's a huge problem but i i can also say that there are there's research ongoing to try to use phage in agriculture and in livestock um, and it, even in aquaculture. So if we were able to reduce the amount of antibiotics that we're using in these industries um, by um, using um, less um, and, and replacing some of it with phage, um, that would, would go a long way, for example, to um, reducing the spread of antimicrobial resistance genes. So that's certainly an area of, of, um, that I know that actively is being pursued by a number of research groups. That's awesome. And if I may ask a follow-up question to that, um, because that does sound really interesting way to use the phase therapy. I was wondering, would it become, I wasn't sure how much all of this like really costed or if we foresee this being like a cost prohibitive thing compared to antibiotics, for example. And not that, um, I feel like phages could be great. I just know that a lot of companies are, may look at the price of one versus the other and kind of scoff at the price of what could be better, but it may cost more. Yeah, so basically, you know, the general rule is that an antibiotic takes about 10 to 15 years to develop with a price tag of a billion dollars or more. Pharmaceuticals are getting out of the antibiotic development business because of antimicrobial resistance, because their shelf life is so short and because organizations like the UN and the WHO were saying any new antibiotics have to be saved as a last resort, so, which is a disincentive for pharma. So um, in terms of phage though, in terms of its cost, I don't know exactly what it would be charged for, you know, what a company would charge for, because it, it, you know, it's not on the market right now, at least in the West. But um, I can say that phage are very easy to source from the environment. That part is super cheap because they're so plentiful. And that plaque assay that I showed you can be done by high school students. And the Sea Phages program is uh, um, geared towards undergraduate students. Um, and they, you know, get sewage samples, barnyard waste, or whatever, identify phage. The more expensive part is the characterization of, and the purification of those phages. So for example, um, the FDA has a higher bar now unless the patient is about to die. What they wanna see is they want that, the phage sequenced um, and they want to know whether there's any known antimicrobial resistance genes or toxin genes in that phage that, get, that could cause harm. And in which case that um, that phage could might not be used, or it could be that that phage could be genetically modified. The U.S. has yet to approve a genetically modified phage for use in a human, but we're probably 
not far off, maybe even, you know, next year that could happen. Um, but um, the purification of the phage, especially for gram negative bacteria, is also one of the more expensive steps um, because you want to remove as much endotoxin as possible. We don't exactly know the safety threshold for endotoxin, but endotoxin is essentially the lipopolysaccharide layer of the bacterial cell wall in a gram negative bacterium. And it's the, it's the debris from the, the dying bacteria that um, when they are lysed by the phage that um, create the endotoxin. Um, and that can elicit septic shock in the patient, whether it's a human or an animal. So you, you, you want to remove as much endotoxin as possible. And there's different approaches to do that. Now in um, parts of Soviet Union, um, the former Soviet Union, they actually don't go through a fancy endotoxin removal process. They're using sometimes crude phage lysate to treat patients and they haven't found that it's generated a lot of problems, but they're usually not treating intravenously. So, um, but imagine if we had a giant phage library where every the phage are already characterized. We know what receptors they hit. We know which phage they go together well with. That's kind of the front end that needs to be done. If that's done by you know organizations like ours or a private public partnership, then it could be used very cheaply by anybody. So that's why I think that there's huge promise for the developing world. Thank you so much for your answer. That's great. Uh, okay. So we have a question from Stephen on the chat. So he's wondering if behavior and psychosocial components has to be integrated as a package to the therapy, mostly for caretakers, spouses, and children. Yeah, well, um, because phage therapy isn't standard of care or you know approved yet, um, it, we're kind of more ad hoc. Um, I'm certainly somebody who's been um, involved in talking to a lot of patients and families, um, mostly to educate them about what to expect. Um, and we have FAQs on our iPath website, that kind of thing. I could see a role for these psychosocial components because any patient that's, um, you know, in critical care in an ICU in a coma, um, there's a lot of similarities between what my husband went through and COVID patients and the families that are treating for them because, you know, my husband had PTSD, which is like post ICU syndrome, as it's called our family, myself included, had it, we had to be treated. Nobody warned us about that. So there's a whole element of critical care that I think regardless of whether the patient has a superbug or something else, that that's really needed. But for phage therapy, yes, I think that um, it's interesting that many anti-vaxxers are very open to phage therapy because they see it as a green alternative to antibiotics. But nevertheless, I think that if it is going to be um, something that's rolled out as a treatment that we are going to need to have um, supports, not just education, but psychosocial supports um, for families and patients as well. That's great. So thanks again. Um, this has been such a wonderful and, and the discussion after your, uh, after your sharing is also wonderful. Um, just had a one final thought about the path forward in terms of supporting the next generation of you know, colleagues who would be interested in this field of phage therapy. So I know that your NIH uh, trial is um, going to start enrolling in 2022. Um, do you have any thoughts about kind of leveraging that to supplement like an administrative diversity training grant? Is it possible to attach it to the current trial? Yeah, um, certainly um, NIEID is, mm -hmm. is very interested in phage therapy now. They've had um, a call for R21 proposals that came out um, last year, and they've supported 12 or 13 different grants in this area. So um, there's, there are pathways um, through that um, organization. Also, um, NIEHS, certainly from the One Health perspective um, and um, the environmental aspect of, of phage um, is, is another uh, possibility. Um, so I think that there, and um, certainly the Gates Foundation has been interested in phage more the preclinical and basic science perspective. But as we start to, um, expand awareness um, about phage therapy as it's, it's just, uh, I think most infectious disease physicians 
in, um, in the US and maybe Canada and Western Europe have heard about phage therapy now, but we really need to reach out to other disciplines. Um, I can say that um, it's, it's kind of crazy, but um, there's been Hollywood interest in our story and um, it may end up being a movie. If it's a movie, I'll be excited because we'll be able to reach more people. We'll be able to reach more people um, to not only uh, raise awareness and education about superbugs and the potential for phage therapy, but you know, there's, there's been a lot of mistrust and lack of um, hope um, and the mistrust in science that we really need to show that, um, that there is hope in science and, and that sometimes when your back is up against the wall, either as an individual or as a society, that's when your, the a eureka moment happens or some kind of zeitgeist. And it isn't just like me as an individual, it, a lot of things had to happen for this. And, you know, I, like, I think of it as like the planets lining up metagenomics, high throughput sequencing, all of those advancements in science had happened to allow this field to kind of move forward at this right time. But also social media, the story went viral because somebody heard about it and then talked about it and then boom. So, you know, that wouldn't have happened like maybe even 10 years ago. So, so we're just, again, the, the privilege aspect of this um, but then there's, there's some, some people will call it fate. Some people will call it chance, but you know, Louis Pasteur said chance favors the prepared mind. So I would say to all of you that as you go, um, and, and to undertake your Glocal project, um, when wrinkles or things go sideways, don't always see it as a negative, see it as you know, like Alexander Fleming contaminated his, his Petri dishes with a mold. He said, oh my God, that mold is killing bacteria. That turned out to be penicillin later on, right? So sometimes these accidents or negative things can come to, to be turned into something positive. So if our story inspires you to, um, you know, make a new discovery or to, to, go down a path that you wouldn't have otherwise, then um, I'll consider it a success. Right. Well, thank you so much again. And um, this was a really great start of our, you know, career development uh, webinar. So, uh, and thank you colleagues and trainees for joining and we'll reconvene, um, I think in November.